Well, I want to welcome you to our 13th session of the exploration of the Gospel of John. And uh, we are in session 13, but which also happens to be John 13. And so uh, uh, whenever we enter the Word of God, we always want to do that with the sanction of the Holy Spirit. So let's start uh, the way we should always start when we enter the Word. Where it's, a, it's not an intellectual experience, it's a supernatural experience. So let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for this opportunity that you've provided. We pray, Father, that you would open our hearts and lives to your word, and we solicit the presence of the Holy Spirit to illuminate just what it is that you would have us carry away from this hour. As we commit this hour and ourselves into your hands, in the name of our coming King, Yeshua, the Lord Jesus Christ, indeed. Amen. Okay. Well, in case we had some stragglers that may have missed, you know, we, had, we divide the whole program into two units, and a session or two ago we shifted from unit one to unit two, but I thought it'd be useful just to g at this point to take a, a, uh, a look at where we are. The first chapter, of course, was full of the pre-existent one and the unusual metaphors, very rich metaphors that, that uh, God uses uh, in, these, in this book. But then we went through John the Baptist and, and we, the call of the disciples. But then it, that entered a section of the book from chapters 2 through 11 that some people call the book of the signs. And uh, there, were, there were seven signs that uh, dominate the book. Changing the water into wine, of course, at Cana. Uh, healing the official son at Capernaum. Uh, healing the invalid, the imp imp impotent man in, uh, at the Pool of Bethes uh, Bethesda. Feeding the 5,000 at the Sea of Galilee. And as most of you probably know, it's a misnomer. They only count the men, so there's probably 10,000 people there, plus children, who knows. But in any case, um, then walking on the water uh, on the Sea of Galilee, and then the healing the blind man in Jerusalem, and then uh, raising dead Lazarus at Bethany. And so these are seven key signs. There are seven miracles, seven discourses, and seven I am statements that structure the book, which causes... Um, some, and I'm, I'm in that group, that suspect, we can't prove it, but we suspect that uh, John wrote this after he was at Patmos. Most of us presume that Patmos was the last thing he did for a lot of reasons. But the more you study this, you begin to realize as we go through John, you'll notice that he presumes the readers have read Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He makes allusions to that as if you know that, and that implies you've read and uh, things that he hadn't said yet, but you, you, can, you get that impression for what it's worth. Okay, so uh, now I, I, we are, we're now in unit two, if you will. Uh, we had the supper at, well, we had the raising of Lazarus, of course, but then we had the supper at Bethany uh, and last time. Uh, this time we'll be talking about the washing and betrayal in chapter 13. Uh, what will be forthcoming the next chapter will be a new promise, and many people don't realize he, what he's talking about in that, and we'll explore that when we get there next time. And then the chapter, chapters uh, 14, 15, 16, and 17, 17 being the prayer of intercession, uh, 14, 15, 16, 17 probably occurred in the upper room and or on the way to Gethsemane, and because uh, we, we find him in chapter 18 at Gethsemane. And... Uh, so, uh, and then, uh, of course, 19, we have the crucifixion, 20, we have the resurrection, and 21, the epilogue of some events that occurred subsequently. And that's, th and that's the gospel. But the group that we're in right now, from 14 to 17, are known to many scholars as the upper room discourse. And we don't know at what point they left the room and were walking to Gethsemane. They weren't that far away, and yet we know that when that's finished, they will be at Gethsemane. So different scholars have different suppositions. But the thing I'd like you to be sensitive to is John's Gospel, as we call it. Now, it's kind of a different book than the first three. That what we, we, uh, Ma uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we call the synoptic Gospels. We, they have uh, some similarities that cause people to cluster them. John's Gospel is very different. The first three are narratives, sort of like history books, so to speak. But uh, John is really an editorial piece. And he makes no uh, bones about that. In chapter 20, he says, these things are written that you might believe that Christ, he has an agenda. He's, he's, and so 
It's interesting that his entire work here, the, what we call the gospel, covers 21 days of three and a half years of ministry. Three and a half years, but he's covering 21 days. Virtually half of this book is devoted to what we call the final week. And we're in that final week where we are now. And yet we're at the halfway point, roughly. Uh, one third of the, uh, the verses. And I, 247 of 879, but who's counting, right? Are devoted to one 24-hour period. So you see, he's really zeroing, uh, zeroing in and focusing on, uh, on this, so for what it's worth. So John 13 to 17 is a unit and uh, as the upper room discourse. Now, this takes the place of what people call the Olivet Discourse in the Synoptic, in the synoptic uh, Gospels. Now, there's an error in that, incidentally, because the Synoptic Gospels deal with Matthew 24 and 25 and Mark 13, which are the Olivet Discourse. Luke 21 has a discourse very similar so similar that nine out of ten expositors miss the point. It's a not in the, uh, the Mount of Olives. It's in the it's in the temple during the day. Different audience, different message, different conclusions. So just be alert to that because that there's a whole discovery you come to by digging that out properly. But anyway, moving on here, we're going to see Jesus now alone with his own. We're uh, we're we're not talking about. Before Matthew chapter 12, he's, he speaks in public and so forth. And back from chapter 12 of Matthew on, he never speaks in public except in parables. And he deliberately does that so the public won't understand what he's talking about. And I hope you don't believe that. It's true. But I want you to check that out by reading very carefully Matthew 13. You'll discover why does he speak. They ask him, why do you speak in, in parables? And he quotes a prophecy from Isaiah. So at hearing, they won't hear and so forth. Because he's been rejected by then. There's a big milestone you need to understand, especially when you're doing Matthew, uh, the Gospel of Matthew. But at this point, <coughs> he's even more alone in the sense that he's focusing now on his disciples. The conversations that you're going to be part of from this chapter on into Gethsemane, these next uh, uh, three, four, five chapters, he's alone with his disciples. So be prepared for an intimacy. Be prepared for getting a glimpse of this person. And, uh, and I might add, it's probably a glimpse that very few people really grasp. This isn't just a very famous teacher. This isn't some great prophet of the Bible. No, this is the creator himself incarnate. And that's staggering to really embrace. We can glibly talk about that. We can easily prove that. But it's quite another to really appropriate that, to understand who he is. And one of the things I hope we, uh, it's typically my style in these expositions to dig out things that you may not know and to color things with something, you know, do some homework, whatever. Uh, I don't think we're going to do a lot of that in the next few chapters. I would rather us really, somehow, by the grace of God and the uh, action of the Holy Spirit, get a clearer glimpse of the person, the person. So he's alone now with his own. He's facing a sacrificial death. He knows what's coming. Yet his concern is not for himself, it's for his disciples. It's amazing to see him encourage them. He's the one that uh, we should be ministering to. No, he's ministering them. And it's interesting, you saw Paul do the same thing when he writes the prison epistles. He's in prison, but he's encouraging his readers. Interesting interesting mindset. So uh, now this discourse we're going to be in, and I don't, I don't mean just tonight, I mean the next few chapters too, is the seed plot of all the grace teaching in the scripture. So let's just jump in, chapter 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, Having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. You know, it's a staggering statement, really. With all that's going on, the cosmic war that's going to be uh, climaxed here, his focus is as on his own and, he, and loving them. People say, why does God bother? I really don't know. Why did God go through this whole program from Genesis 3 to Revelation 22? 
to demonstrate infinite love. We can imagine ways you can uh, demonstrate infinite power. If you study astronomy, you get some glimpses of that. We can probably imagine infinite knowledge, omniscience, whatever. We at least think we can talk about those things. But how you talk about infinite love? Where God creates a being, knowing that giving that being free will, he's going to get into get himself into a predicament that nothing less than the death of God himself would avail to extricate him from that predicament. Why would he do that? To demonstrate infinite love. And that's that's the real drama that's unfolding here in this book. But let's move on. And, and supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So part of the, the event that's going to take our attention here in the early part of this chapter is the betrayal of Judas. How many knew that Judas betrayed him? Okay, okay that's two of you. That's pretty good. All right. Supper being ended. Now, Passover supper included four cups, by the way. Those cups have names. They come out of Exodus chapter 6. The first one's called the bringing out. The second, the delivering. The third is the redemption or blessing. And the fourth is the taking out. And uh, what uh, uh, it, on those occasions when we really get into this, we point out that they, uh, the fourth one wasn't touched. Jesus, they, they, he administered the Lord's Supper with the third cup. And then uh, the fourth one, he said he would not touch the uh, fruit of the vine until we're all together in heaven. And so uh, that's a, a side study that I encourage you to be aware of. John doesn't focus on that here, so we're not going to make a big thing of it, but I want to not leave it unmentioned as we go. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from the supper and he does something that startled everyone there. He rises from the supper, he laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poureth water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Now, this is a very strange procedure. Now, it was a very common procedure for a slave to do that in certain conditions. There's no slave here, and a Jew wasn't allowed to do that, by the way, normally. That's another whole thing we'll get into here in a minute. But, uh, well, he, when he removed his outer garment, hematia, that he was still wearing a tunic, the normal costume for a servant, in other words, okay? And a slave of Jewish birth could not be forced to wash feet, incidentally. So that makes this whole procedure even more startling to the Jewish mind. And uh, there is, of course, the whole concept of a doulos, the bond slave in Exodus 21. You can check that out. And, and Jesus very much had that mindset as is celebrated in the, in the Philippians, in what's called the kenosis how he humbled himself, and so forth. Those are all side studies I encourage you to track down on your own. We'll keep moving here. The word wash may confuse many people because two different Greek words are used in this passage about washing. The Bible speaks of being washed in two different ways, and they're similar and yet quite different. Washed once and for all we are, and Hebrews 10 celebrates that, and in the other ways we're washed daily. The once is a, the one is a once and for all thing. That's when we're washed in his blood. And the other one is washed daily because we get defiled through the day. See, washing with blood, that's got to God word. Leviticus 16 deals with that. Atonement and all the rest. And uh, then we have, and uh, there's a, a Greek term which involves bathing the entire body. And we see it in Acts 9 and 2 Peter 2. There's a different Greek word, which is cleansing a particular soil, uh, soiled area, hands or feet or what have you. And those are two distinctly different practices for two different reasons. Washing with the water of the word, of course, is saint word. Washing with, uh, towards God word is the atonement. That's once and for all. Washing with the water, saint word, is daily. We offend each other daily. The offense we've done to God was paid for 2,000 years ago on a, there's, there's on, on a, on a cross. So there's, there's, there's a distinction. And uh, we touched on some of this when we were in the wedding of Cana, with Numbers 19, the water purification. And so you can go back and review your notes in, on, uh, 
on the, the wedding at Cana. The first bath is the fast bath of regeneration. Titus 3.5 is one of your reverses for that. And this deals with relationship, position, and guilt in an absolute broad sense and in in, in, in that deals with justification. And it's once and for all, according to Hebrews 10, the first 12 verses in Hebrews 10 will nail that for you. Daily washing is a different thing altogether, and that's to cleanse us from defilement during the day. And uh, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is just and faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's a daily thing. That's a daily thing. That's why many people call 1 John 1, 9 the Christian's bar of soap. We need to do that all the time. And uh, so, and what do we wash with? The Word. And Ephesians 5 uses that phrase, so does Psalm 119. In that sense, we wash in the Word. And so, now, washing the feet has another element uh, suggestive of it, and that's it's, uh, feet speak of our, a walk. And that's where we refresh our walk, if you will. And that's where, again, the kenosis is a good basic text to go re reflect on that in a devotional sense um, uh, as you have opportunity. And, of course, what's interesting about these two forms of washing, we're washed in his blood in the regeneration sense on the cross, his blood was shed for us, but at the cross, both come out. It's a very interesting thing is that in Jewish practice at Passover, they add warm water to the wine. And there are rabbinical papers written for centuries speculating why they do that. They're not sure why they do that. Different rabbis have different theories as to why they do it. They're not sure. The answer is in Matthew 27. When a Roman soldier thrusts that, throws that, violates his orders, he was supposed to break the bones and he didn't do that. He didn't know that that would be breaking the Torah, because Leviticus said not a bone would be broken, it's also celebrated in the Psalms. But he did what he thought was practical, he threw a spear up to the side, and what came out? Blood and water. Now there are ar medical articles in the American Medical Association Journal from Psalm 22, which determine the cause of death, very erudite, uh, interesting article, but they draw all kinds of interesting conclusions from that observation. But spiritually, of course, here's what's also come out, being washed in his blood and being washed in water in two different ways. Both came out then. But anyway, we'll move, we'll move. I, just, I don't want to make a career of that, but I want you to be aware of the fact that there's no way you can exhaust this gospel. One of the characteristics of the Gospel of John, they often say, it's shallow enough for a child to wade in, and it's deep enough for an elephant to bathe in. In other words, you can go through this gospel very lightly and get a lot out of it in a very primitive, I'm a new Christian kind of way. You can also have studied the Bible for 65 years and been into every nook and corner of the Bible, and when you go through the book of John, you'll discover something new. You can't exhaust it. And John's not the only book like that, but it is a very clear character of John. So we, uh, I, I have to almost militate against digging in some of these nooks and crannies because it's, you can also lose the perspective of the book, and I think our primary goal here is to maintain that perspective. But these are places you can peel off and dig in on your own. And that's our goal, by the way. Let me underscore that. Um, we're not here to sell you a particular point of view. What we're really, our goal is to equip you to come to your own conclusions. We will share with you candidly the views we hold and tell you why we hold them, but don't misunderstand that. That's advanced just as an in uh, the intent there is to help you find a way, but we're counting on you developing critical thinking skills. We're uh, uh, going to uh, press to acquaint you with resources, and our hope isn't that you, you nod in agreement with what we believe. That would be a mistake. Again and again, I'll try to challenge you just the other way around. Um, no, what I do, uh, what uh, our goal is to have you learn enough about your Bible and navigate your knowledgeably na navigate your way through the the, the uh, various places, but have enough perspective of the total to be able to draw your own conclusions. Because your ultimate protection against heresy or false views is what they call the whole counsel of God. And until you really have a grasp of the whole council, you don't know how these pieces fit together. And our hope is to give you enough perspective of that that you can find your own way, but 
there are controversies among good scholars, and we'll try to highlight that as we go, where good guys with great uh, backgrounds and, and great minds have different views of some of these areas. So we want you to be sensitive to that. Anyway, let's keep moving here. We're at verse 6. Then cometh he, Jesus, to Simon Peter. And Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Well, you know, you know how patient Peter was. <laughs> and uh, so Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. See, he felt that was too demeaning for Christ to be doing that. And Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Ouch! Wow! And Simon Peter picks up pretty quickly here. Primus who saith him, I saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. <laughs> He's a, you know, Peter's our kind of a guy. If a little bit's good, a whole lot's a lot better, you know. And uh, so, uh, I wash thee. See, you, you, you can't wash your own feet, by the way. That's the thought here. So Jesus is washing them for him. And so, uh, how does Jesus wash us today? That's a good question for discussion. That's a good question for an exam here. How does he do that to you? Does he use a washcloth? You don't wear sandals. I mean, what's the deal here? Solomon 119.9 gives you a clue. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. The word of God is the way to it. And the word of God is obviously in your lap, but the word of God is also incarnate and present among us. Let's understand that. John 15, 3. We'll fi- we, when we get to chapter 15, we'll have the uh, 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 Bread of Life thing. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. There again, the same, same technique. Ephesians 5. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might do what? Sanctify and cleanse it. How? With the washing of the water by the word. That's where we get this equivalency with the word and, the, uh, uh, and water, if you will. Now, it's interesting, at baptism, the relationship of the disciples to the waters, they were immersed in it, right? When you see them in Revelation chapter 5, before the throne, they're not in it, they're standing on it. It's become a glassy sea. They're standing on it. And you say, gee, Chuck, you're, you're, you're mixing metaphors. No, those are metaphors the Holy Spirit's using. And for good reason. And then, of course, 1 John 1, 9 is perhaps the capstone of these, at least in my mind. The Christians borrow soap. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How precious that is. Because the time will come, and it may be less than 24 hours away, when you stumble. You really blow it. What do you do? You grieve, pout, feel you've fallen, lost your salvation. No, you say, praise God, the flesh is exactly what you said it was, and you retreat. You confess it knowing that he he is faithful. Not your faithfulness, he is faithful and, uh, and, and just. The faithfulness and the justice here comes from him, not from us to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. And he can do that because he's paid the price. Okay, let's keep on verse 10. Jesus saith to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean. That's great, but there's a comma, and there's a caveat. Whoops. And ye are clean, but not all. Uh Uh-oh, there's some fine print here. Someone among them isn't. So you can tell what's coming here, can't you? For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, ye are not all clean. Now there's something that's going to occur here that it's amazing to me how many people don't realize what's going on. If you study Matthew and some of the other Gospels, you know that the leadership was out to kill him. But they expressly committed themselves not to do it on a holiday. 
It's in the text. The reason is obvious, because they were terrified of the Romans. The Romans, to the, to the Roman mind, the unpardonable sin was an insurrection, an uprising. Their job was to keep the peace. And so they almost didn't care what happened as long as it didn't create any turmoil. Now, when there was a holiday, like, and of all the, there's, of the seven feet, well, there's three holidays in the Jewish calendar that every able bodied male Jew had to be there, was supposed to be there. And Passover was the queen of the three. Shavuot was another, and Feast of Tabernacles another. Point is, the, um, uh, this was a, a town, I don't know what the real numbers are, but I would imagine Jerusalem was probably a place of 100,000, 200,000 so at the most. But at holiday, there'd be over one to two million people there. They've got estimates that suggest they were, that you can't imagine the crowds because of all of that. So you can imagine the Roman um, uh, tribunes and whoever were really uptight. They didn't want to have some kind of turmoil during the holiday period. And the Jewish leadership understood that if they're going to take Christ and create a problem here, they're not going to want to do it on a holiday. So what's going on here, which you need to understand, is Judas had made his deal with the priests, but they weren't planning to do it that night. In fact, Jesus is letting the cat out of the bag, as we would, might say. Or the other expression we sometimes say, he, he has to fish or cut bait. Because Jesus is going to announce to the gang that someone's going to betray him. And that creates a huge problem for Judas. It presses the issue. If he's not going to do it, okay, great. If he is going to do it, he's got to do it right now. Because the word's out. He's got a problem. You need to understand. Now what's interesting here, the piece I want to get across, who's controlling the evening? Who's controlling the timing? Jesus is. And you'll discover when, as we study it carefully, all through every detail, Jesus is the one in charge. He's the one that gets the disciples released at Gethsemane. He's the one that step by step by step deals with it. So, okay, for he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, ye are not all clean. Now there are absolutely two different words here in about washing. He says he that is, uh, washing means bathed in one case, and nipto is the other one, it's translated wash. He's a babe that needeth not to accept to wash his feet. So again, we have those two Greek words in antith antiphony going all the way through here. Our Lord is teaching that when we come to the cross, when we came to Jesus, we were washed all over. And this is the bath or the regeneration. This is the, the, the uh, memorialized by the baptism, but it's intended to be basically a once and for all kind of thing. And it's paid for by the blood on the cross. When we walk through this world, that's daily, we are defiled and we get dirty. We become disobedient and sin gets into our lives. And that's a different kind of washing. The, wa the washing of the feet, the nipto, is the cleansing in order to restore us to fellowship. So it's, there's two different kinds of washing in view here. And, uh, and the first John, uh, John amplifies this in his first letter. He says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ his son keeps on cleaning us from all sin. That, that's a present, that verb is a present, a present tense, a continuing operation. Keeps on cleaning us, in other words. Anyway, verse 12, and so after he had washed their feet, now notice who is being washed here. Judas was still present. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, this is finally exam time, guys, okay? Know ye what I have done unto you. Now, I'm going to show you Jesus' organization chart. That's, what he's, that's really what he's showing here, okay? We make organization charts from the top down, the supervisory charts, right? That's what we typically do some variation of. Jesus is, has a different concept altogether. The other way around. His is an, an enabling chart. An enabling chart. And it's interesting how even in cor corporate organizations, there are styles of leadership 
that enable the people, not just supervise over them, but enable them by giving them the tools, the resources, the encouragement, the conditions, that so they can succeed. Where the person down here makes sure they can succeed. Different concept in the organization. But that's what we're dealing with. See, Jesus' organization chart is not from the top down, it's rather from the bottom up. It's an enabling chart. So the word Jesus, by the way, this may su come as a surprise. Do you know that we never find the apostles addressing him as Jesus while he was with them on the earth? That's an interesting thing. He exhorted them to call him Lord, and so they do. That's interesting. The disciples him call him Lord all through the scripture. Jesus in the narratives are called Jesus, but that's written by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has the right to do that. But uh, I won't want you to overreact to that, but I think this, it's interesting here. There is a concept that is missing from many of our pulpits, and that's called the fear of God. And I'm in the process of doing a careful, slow uh, background study, but I'm going to, I hope to have it out in a, some number of weeks, called, uh, uh, I'm going to call it, the, I, if I say it, the fear of God, that'll, that's a turnoff. I'll say, call it the beginning of wisdom. Everybody knows that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, so I'll give it a little more of a positive. But, the one, but w part one of the two-part thing, there are 18 different Hebrew words used for the f fear of God, and 17 of the 18 involve trembling. I mean, it's not this, well, it's just a reverential. I've heard pastors, well, it, what it really means is just a reverence, a reverential awe. No, 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 that's not true. The, the exegetical, the, the language is one of terror. He is God. He's not our buddy. He's God. Now, through the grace in Christ, yes, we have a very intimate relationship with him, and we want to honor that and appropriate it and, and uh, understand it. But let's not, there's a difference between being intimate and being familiar. And we need to remember who he is. He breathed the universe uh, into being. And uh, he has, uh, anyway, let's see. Yeah. Uh, we'll move on here. Who did call him Jesus? Two groups called him Jesus. His enemies, Matthew 26 is an example, and demons. I don't think you want to line up with any of these guys. He's our master. He's our Lord. He's, you know, whatever. So, For I've given you an example that ye should do as I have done unto you. Verily, verily, I say unto you. You know, it's interesting. When Jesus wants to emphasize something, he says, I say unto you. He wants to really underline. He says, verily, I say unto you. When he, when he really, really, really wants to, he says, verily, verily, I say unto you. And that's amen, amen, in the same word, by the way. But anyway, verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. Neither is he that is sent greater than he that sent him. Now that's sort of logical, isn't it? And yet, and yet we need to keep that in focus. Did God promise Jesus persecution? Yes. Boy, did he, was he persecuted? Should we be surprised if we're persecuted? We're not greater than he is. And that's also taught in many places we go in here. I've given you an example is the term there. And that's an example, not an ordinance, incidentally. There's no ordinance for foot washing kinds of things. He did it here as an example. This is not like the Lord's Supper, which is an ordinance. It's not like baptism, which we are commanded to do. And so no one, th now it, it happens, there are many groups that do, do foot washing, and using it as an example or to make a point, nothing wrong with that. But just don't, don't get carried away as a sacrament, is I think the point here. And so, and by the way, in terms of this foot washing as a, as a procedure, there's no reference in any epistle for doing that. There's no evidence prior to the fourth century. And uh, it was linked to the custom of wearing sandals, which came out of fashion and, and, and so forth. And uh, the whole idea, though, it's an example of humility. It is also a rebuke to pride. So it's a constructive thing to do. It's just a teaching, a picture of our daily cleansing. It's a picture of our daily cleansing. It's, it, 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 it's a modeling of 1 John uh, 1.9. And, uh, and, so, and it's also, 
a warning to Judas Iscariot. He should have picked up on that. It's a picture of Jesus' humiliation. It's a reminder of his union and communion with the believer. Two of the seven verily verilies spoken in the upper room were in the context of the foot washing. So it's a non-trivial thing. Now we are exploring using this as a trophy in the Institute. As you know, we have the three different, uh, we have the bronze, silver, gold medallion thing that people can earn. And we're thinking of you, we found a, a sculpture, it's at the Southeastern University uh, in, uh, in, Florida, in Florida. And uh, the sculptor has made it available in smaller things. And we're exploring the idea of using this as a trophy when people reach in probably the gold level of the three as just something for the, for as a, as a you know, for the desk or whatever to, to, uh, to have an investiture ceremony that their, their feet are washed by the guy that mattered the most to get to that point. We're going to fool around with that as a possibility. But anyway, let's move on here. Jesus says, if ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen. But that the scripture may be fulfilled, he that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. So he's starting to break the news here. And um, he that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. And he's going to draw from Psalm 41. And uh, 41.9. And the allusion in the psalm is an occasion when David was betrayed by Ahithophel. Ahithophel was an elderly gentleman that was his counselor, one of his primary counselors. And Ahithophel betrays David. Absalom is going to lead a rebellion, and Ahithophel helps Absalom. David's respected advisor is helping Absalom, so, he's, so David's being betrayed by Ahithophel, and that allusion by David in the Psalms is referenced by Christ here. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. That's a phrase out of Psalm 41.9. By the way, back in uh, John chapter 6, Jesus had warned them of all this a year in advance. You'll find the, that allusion back there in, in uh, John, John chapter 6, verse 70 and 71. You can look it up on your own. Lifted up his heel. That's a metaphor. Not might be familiar. Well, in this, in this rural community, most of you are probably familiar with that. But anyway, it's a metaphor of a sudden kick of a mule or a horse. Now, uh, you know, us city folk don't know much about that, but we can get the idea, okay? Now, bec uh, it's interesting. They were all sitting at the on mats around a 12-inch high table, if you understand the style of the, the supper there. John was to his right, and Judas, Judas was to his left. Now, the person on the left was the honored person in their culture. So Judas, had he was the guest of honor in that sense. But strangely enough, not so strange, I think it's quite understandable, because of this, classical artists always use the right to be the right one, the best one, the good one. In classical art, to be left on the left side in French is gauche or sinister. In contrast to Dexter and so, in other words, things that are right-handed are good things, and things that are left-handed are bad things. And I think many kids have been abused by that because they may have intrinsic left-handedness, and that was a uh, that was a lack. If you study classical art, though, and I'll use Rodin, Augusta Rodin as an example. Um, oh, by the way, five times John uh, is alluded in this uh, as the one whom Jesus loved, and Judas is on the left, place reserved for an honored guest. But what's interesting, if you study Rodin, who's pr I think pretty widely regarded as the ultimate sculptor, he just did a, he could express emotion even in just hands, actually. But one of his most famous pieces is called the Cathedral. And most people who know art know his, the, the thing he calls Cathedral. What most people don't notice is they're both right hands. That's not one person holding his hands up in prayer, it's two people together holding him up, because he chose two right hands. See, right was good, and left was bad. When he did things with Satan, it was always the left hand. And, and when he does a thing called the hand of God, he has a hand that's, there's some clay he's squeezing, and Adam's coming out of it, and it's a very famous piece by Rodin. 
And if you're ever in Philadelphia, or, or in obviously in, in, the, in the Louvre in Paris, uh, ro the, the Rodin exhibits are really worth taking in. It's amazing um, how he, uh, he captures emotion in just such simple things. But I don't want to spend it on time. Let's go on here. Uh, verse 19, Jesus says, Now I tell you before it come, that when it is come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. In other words, honor him as the Father. Jesus now is turning their attention away from the traitor to their master. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. Now that was a bombshell. Can you imagine? These guys had been in deep fellowship for three and a half years and uh, discovered that there is a traitor among them had to come as a shock. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. I think that's kind of interesting. There may have been one or two that had a suspicion, but apparently that wasn't clear. It wasn't like Judas had been singled out yet, it would seem. And uh, now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Who was that? John. John, in a very um, unfacing way, always re just refers to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. As if he didn't love the others? No, that's not the point. It's just that John had a very special, affectionate relationship with the Master. And to prove that to you, when Jesus is hanging on the cross, He's got two half-brothers in the audience. And he consigns, consigns his mother to the Apostle John, not one of his own family, to take care of her in her old age. And John, the Apostle, does, takes care of her. And when he retires, ultimately after Patmos in Ephesus, Mary's there. And I think there's probably one guy in 20 that understands that Second John is a personal letter to Mary. And you can prove that from the text, actually. But it's, you won't find it in the expository literature for some weird reason. Another story, another time. Um, so he was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of the disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter, therefore, in other words, he was one over further, see. Simon Peter, therefore, beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spoke. He then, lying on Jesus' breast, saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Interesting situation here. If I'm, if I'm Jesus, I've got, I've got um, John at my right, right? And I've got Peter next to him. Peter's asking John, you ask him. See, Peter's yielding, maybe just because he's closer, that might be it, just simpler. Or it may be that he, taking advantage of that, he realizes that John has, has more access somehow. Both John and Peter, along with James, were the inner circle anyway. So I don't know this, I assume that next to Peter was James, because those three were always the insiders. At uh, the transfiguration, at Jairus, the raising of Jairus, and so on. So anyway, he then, lying on Jesus' breast, namely John, saith unto him, Lord, who is it? And uh, so, now Peter's distance here, by the way, it's interesting that he uses John as an intermediary. Later on, we're going to notice, too, that Peter's always following afar off. He's got a little distance here. And uh, we'll get into that more later. Jesus answered, and said, He it is to whom I shall give a sop, a morsel, if you will, uh, when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now that's obvious to us because Jesus is, is highlighting that to John. You do get the impression that the group in general didn't pick up on this yet. Okay? But the Lord makes Judas his guest of honor by this gesture, by giving him the sop. That, was put, that's what ba that Judas was in the favored guest of honor position there. But foreknowledge is not causation. He didn't do it because it was predicted. It was predicted because he did it. Don't get that confused. Our people have all clever theories that just aren't true. Um, and after the sop, Satan entered into him. And then Jesus said unto him, that thou doest, do quickly. So Judas is on the spot. He's got to get out of there. He's got to go track down his benefactors. They got to figure out 
They get an access to Pilate in the morning. That's not easily done. They had to get their act together for Gethsemane. That all, all those arrangements were not ready. That's why they're in Gethsemane so long. And they finally show up, of course, with the arrest and all of that. And you know what happens subsequently. And so, okay. And who is controlling the timing? Obviously, Jesus is. That was not their plan. Not on a primary holiday for fear of the Romans. And I've covered that already. Okay. Now, no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. John picked up on it, obviously, but the rest didn't quite pick up on all this. For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag that Jesus had said unto him, buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. In other words, Judas picks up and splits. And the speculation, they don't know why. They figured he might be on a, he was sort of the treasurer of the group. He had the bag. And they presumed that maybe Jesus had given him some errand to go. And uh, so, but, uh, and, but having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. And this is one of those places where I think the Holy Spirit is deliberately using a metaphor. Yes, it was night. No, it was also a time of spiritual darkness. Okay. Well, it's, uh, it was night indeed, in other words. Let's take this occasion to examine Judas a little bit. Um, he's the son of Simon, as is, is, he's been identified several times already. And uh, Iscariot, uh, uh, Iscariot is actually Ishkarioth, which is a man of Kerioth, which is a place in Judah. He's the only one of the disciples that wasn't from Galilee. He was from Judea, if you will. And uh, this distinguishes him also from the other Judas, uh, the, the half-brother of Jesus Christ, and also from the other 11 apostles who were all, of the, all from Galilee, if you will. He was thus uh, connected with Judah, his prototype, who sold Joseph, and the Jews who also delivered Jesus up to the Roman Gentiles. Now, what's interesting here, that's an illusion of typology. Uh, Arthur W. Pink, in his book on Genesis, actually lists a hundred different ways that j the story of Joseph foreshadows the life of Christ. And uh, once you start into that, it's astonishing to realize the parallelism of the dramas. And that's, so again, uh, uh, the Judah was the one that was a ringleader there, and so we're and we have Judah, Judas here. Now, um, uh, he obeyed the call of Jesus, Judas did, like the rest, probably influenced by John the Baptist's ministry and his own messianic hopes. And uh, his earliest hint of his badness, if you will, was back in John 6. And that was a year before the crucifixion. And uh, back there, even there, you got a hint because it said back there, some of you believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who believed not and who would betray him. And uh, have not I chosen uh, uh, one of you as a devil and so forth. And uh, so sagacity in business apparently is one of his natural gifts because that, that's why he ended up becoming a bearer of the common purse. And uh, so he's placed last among the twelve because of his subsequent treachery. But even previously, he was part of a group of the four lowest in respect of zeal, faith, and love. And you can track that down on your own, but go on here. Um, yet even then, at this time, at the dinner, repentance was not too late for him. He could have shifted. Peter, the foremost of the twelve, had so shrunk from the cross as to be called Satan back there at Caesarea Philippi in Matthew 16. Yet Peter recovered more than once afterward. You could, you could bounce back from these things, and he could have too. And uh, so, so Jesus has many warnings against the mammon love were calls to Judas while he had not yet made his fatal and final choice. And you go through those re references and see there were all kinds of opportunities of repair there. And uh, before this crisis, Judas had salvation and even a high place of honor in Christ's future kingdom within his reach. Don't be sorry to say he was saved, but he had it within his reach, if you will. And uh, Mary had spent her all to honor Jesus, you remember, with the washing his feet with the, 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 the burial things and so forth. And uh, Judas, in contrast to that, betrayed him to the death and, to the death and burial. And uh, so, but uh, temptation fell in his way when larger contributions were made part of what uh, spent for necessities and the rest was given to the poor, presumably. That was Luke 8, you see all that. 
Judas as treasurer grudged the 300 pence worth of ointment that was lavished on, by Mary on Jesus as money which should have uh, come to him with a purse. And that led some of the other disciples to join in the cry. And uh, so he was, a, he was a troublemaker in that sense. And so covetousness, of course, prompted the subjection. And uh, now he had hope of a larger gain that kept him from apostasy a year before, and that's all in John 6. And uh, the narrative, by the way, doesn't give any ground for a clever theory that some people hold that Judas betrayed Christ mainly in order to force him to declare its true nature and the kingdom and that Judas might have a place in it. So there's a theory of that. In fact, Andrew Lloyd Webber did a Jesus Christ superstar thing which makes, tries to make Judas the hero, sort of. And it's a, uh, just, uh, just a uh, uh, nonsense. And uh, rather, covetousness uh, was unchecked in, Ju uh, in Judas. And um, he, uh, as he began to realize the kingdom wasn't of the, a carnal thing, uh, that y he yielded himself up to his Satan's tool. And so... Uh, so only now, the lost chance of the 300 pence from Mary's thing, the invict his vindictiveness at Jesus' reproof in John 12, the secret view that Jesus saw a kingdom of power and wealth, in, at least in his mind, drove him to this last desperate shift to clutch at 30 pieces of silver the paltry price of a slave. Can you imagine? To and betray his Lord. Now, it's interesting how prophecy foretold his doom, and Psalm 109 is full of that, not just Psalm 41, 9. Psalm 109. Uh, uh, Peter said, The scripture must needs be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit by the, by the mouth of David spoke before concerning Judas, and he obtained part of his ministry, from which by transgression he fell that he might go to his own place. His own place. And uh, Now Ahithophel is a type the, pa the verse in the Psalms, Psalm 41.9, is David talking about when he was betrayed by Ahithophel. And so there's more here to perhaps dig into a little bit. Um, Ahithophel is sort of a type of Judas in a sense because he also had very shrewd sagacity with intimate knowledge of David, which he turned against David, giving the counsel for incest and parasite to, to David. And that's all, of course, in the scriptures, and you, you can chase those things down there. But one of the things most people don't realize, they're all puzzled, why did this aged advisor to David join the rebellion, advise Absalom in his rebellion against David? And it's funny how if you just do a little bit of, God always rewards the diligent, okay? The question is, see David's counselor, his treachery he touchingly alludes to in the Psalms. David's prayer turned his counsel indeed to what his name indicated. His name, Hidfil means foolishness, okay? Now, Ahithophel was the mainspring of the rebellion. Absalom calculated on his adhesion from the first. So Absalom's counting on uh, Ahithophel helping him. Now, what you, the history doesn't directly explain this to you, but it does turn out if you do a little digging. It turns out Ahithophel was the father of Eliam. Okay, that's in 1 Chronicles 3.5. That means he was the grandfather of Bathsheba. And when you discover that, the fog lifts. Ahithophel was Bathsheba's grandfather, and he never forgave David for corrupting his granddaughter and murdering his gra the, her husband, Uriah. So he's harboring that, and uh, that's, that's lurking in the background. And uh, so the fact that this is so undesigned in the text is a way of confirming the veracity of the whole thing. And uh, so... Uriah the Hittite and Eliam, uh, both on the king's guard, consisting of 37 officers, were intimate, and Uriah married the daughter of his brother's officer, of, the bro of, his, of, the, uh, uh, of his brother officer. So, so uh, that made sense. Ahithophel's proposal himself to pursue David that night with 12,000 men and s smite the king only indicates the same personal hostility to David and deep scarcity and boldness. He isn't just a casual advisor here, he's a plotter. He failed from no want of shrewdness on his part, but from the folly of Absalom. His awful end shows that worldly wisdom apart from faith in God turns into suicidal madness. For a hitiful too, just like Judas, 
he's in big trouble. And he's the type of Judas, both in his treachery and in his end, suicide at the end. Well, let's get back to Judas again. See, even Judas shared in Christ's washing of the feet. When Jesus said, you're all clean, but not all. So Judas, of course, knew Christ's habits, and he knew that it was his pattern after dinner to go down to Gethsemane for prayer. And he takes advantage of that to make the arrangements, obviously. And suicide was the end of Ahithophel, and suicide is the end of Judas. The parallel in typology is instructive. Now, when Jesus gave the sop to Judas, the act of love, that is dipping a morsel of unleavened bread in the broth and bitter herbs and handing it to a friend, but it only stirred up his hatred. So after the sop, Satan entered into Judas, and then Jesus said, that, that what I do is too quickly. I want you to remember that Satan had entered Judas. Was because what does Judas do? He goes back to the temple and tries to give him the money back, right? And he says, behold, I have betrayed innocent blood. That's Judas talking. But Satan's in him. Satan, in effect, is declaring Jesus is innocent. I think that's unusual. I think that's interesting. There's a, there's a, there's a reprise there. So the, um, there's a lot more here, but that's enough. The Greek, by the way, what I do do quickly, the Greek really says, what thou art doing with full determination already being carried into action is the Greek implied verb, do more quickly. So what you've already decided to do, do more quickly than you planned, is really what the Greek implies. And so, okay. Well, Judas Iscariot, uh, he'd, given, he'd given them the, the key word that the guy that I kissed, that famous he, take him, you know, that was the way he was going to identify for the guards, the one they want. So when he led the Roman band and priestly officers to apprehend Jesus, he gave his studied kiss, saying, Hail, Master. In fact, Mark's gospel, which is really Peter's gospel, sa he says, the, he already, Master, Master. Hail, you know, it, it's, a, it's a false show of deference. And, um, and Jesus, says, Ju as Jesus approached his friend, Wherefore art thou come? And Judas drew nigh to kiss him. He says, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? That's the way Luke renders that. And uh, it's interesting, when the Lord was condemned by the high priest in the, in the Sanhedrin, that's forthcoming here, Judas was probably present. And the reaction came, not that the condemnation took him by surprise, but his confession shows that he contemplated the result. He began to realize what's going on here. And uh, his former, the, the former Lord's love and righteousness, now remembered, brought into Judas' soul remorse, not repentance. There's a difference there. Uh, the different Greek words. He had remorse. The same way someone gets, uh, he's upset because he was caught, not because he did it. You follow me? Same kind of thing, sort of. And so anyway, moving on here. I sinned in that I betrayed innocent blood, he cried to the high priest as tempters. I, I think that's a fascinating phrase because Satan was speaking there, in effect. That's sa Satan's declaration. And of course, the priests say, what's that to us? You see that to that. And they sneeringly replied. And I love this passage, one of the most interesting prophecies we find there. Um, but first, having served the end, he's now cast aside as, a, as, as vile, even in their eyes. So he forces away in the sanctuary of the priest. He flung down the money, his bait to sin, and now only hateful and tormenting to him and so forth. And, uh, and then Acts 1.18 will give us the sequel to all this. He burst asunder when the suicide was half accomplished and his bowels gushed out even as he had laid aside bowels of compassion. Psalm 109 details that. He had designed to, pr to provide a possession like a hazy from 2 Kings 5 for himself, and he saw that the kingdom was not then a temporal one. That's when he realized he was chasing the wrong goal here. But the only possession he purchased was a bloody burial place, which the priest bought with the price of blood, being characteristically to punctilious to put in the treasury. Remember, they threw the money there, and he left and committed suicide. Well, they couldn't put the money in the treasury, but they're, they're, they're pretty smart guys. They have good accountants on staff. They said, no, we can't put it in the treasury, but we can prepay anticipated expenses with it. So they bought a field, because there was a bargain field around, they bought that field to bury strangers in. And uh, so what's interesting about that, in Zechariah 11, verse 12 and 13, that's all detailed. The price, the location of the transaction, and who ends up with the money is all there in Zechariah. And uh, 
it's attributed in Matthew that it, the Matthew points that out. That that's a fulfillment of that prophecy. But it speaks of a Jeremiah. That's because the concept was first introduced by Jeremiah back in Jeremiah. Many people get confused by that. But it's all there in Zechariah in any case in detail. And so, um, so the potter's field was to bury strangers in. And it's interesting that fulfilled the, that was foretold in Judas' own doom. Because he was a stranger that buried there. Anyway, moving on. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. And if God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. So this, this verse actually starts the Upper Room Discourse, I believe. But it's only a couple of verses, and we'll just we'll focus that on when we get to chapter 14. Little children, yet a little while, and I'm with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come, so now I say unto you. Little children. And that's just an affectionate term, technia. It's a diminutive teca, tekna. This is the only occurrence in the Gospel of John, but it's used frequently by John in his epistles. But uh, it's interesting that um, he says, I said unto the Jews, one of the things that causes a lot of confusion has through history, when John in his Gospel speaks of the Jews, implicitly he's referring to the leadership. And here's one of the places to prove that. Not the Jews in general, but it could be as few as 13 guys, actually, of the whole bunch. But the point is, when he uses the term Jews, implicitly the context implies the leadership, not the people in general. And there's been a lot of anti-Semitic nonsense that by misunderstanding John's use of that term. But um, glorified. Here's the greatest event in the universe forthcoming. He's going to reverse the conduct of the first man, Adam. Through death destroyed him who had the power of death, the devil. That's going to all occur here. He purchased for himself the entire elect of God. Wow. What held him to that cross? They say he was crucified on a cross of wood, yet he made the hill on which it stood. At any time during that procedure, you say, enough already, I'm out of here. And call it to an end. No. He saw it through. What held him to the cross? It wasn't the nails. His love for you and me. And what also flabbergasts me is to think through the Father's watching. Can you imagine the Father loving us so much as to allow His Son to go through that? Staggering. Staggering. Glorified man at God's right hand. is. There's a man on the throne of God right now. Well, the more you know about the uselessness of man, there's a man on the throne of God right now. Wow. And he goes on here in verse 34, And a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, because of the purity of your doctrine. No, no, I guess that's not what it says. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you have love one to another. My wife has hanging over the ministry in Idaho a little plaque. It says, In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty, but in all things, agape. That doesn't mean we should be casual about doctrine, but it's certainly secondary to demonstrating love for one another. You're, supposed to, so, you know, you're suggesting we give partiality to members of the house of faith? Absolutely, Paul tells us to. A new commandment. In other words, agapeo, not versus phileo. You know, storge versus eros, whatever. One of the interesting things you can do, and I'm sorry I didn't allow the time to actually do this here, so I'll just suggest you do it on your own. Take 1 Corinthians 13 and uh, read it with your name in it. As you read it, put your name there, and you won't get very far when you'll stumble because it's, it's portraying something far out of our reach. You know, the, the Chuck beareth all things, Chuck believeth all things, you know, Chuck, Chuck, Chuck. And, and it's a, you, you start laughing because you're, you're, you don't even come close. Then go back and read First Corinthians and put Jesus' name in it. And it fits like a glove. And you begin to realize the disparity that we need to deal with. But we've got to wrap this up here, so let's keep moving here. Um, and if you want more information on any of these subjects, I really encourage you to take a look at a book called The Way of Agape. And it'll be among our materials if you're interested in that. It's a, a very practical, down-to-earth application of all these things. 
Well, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? And Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Hmm. Peter said unto him, Lord, why can I not follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Well, you'll get your chance, Peter, but that's not what's coming. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Wow. Wow. Jesus is going to give him a chance. And when the resurrection takes place, the angels tell the women, go tell the disciples and Peter. Ooh. He's still saved, but he's not a disciple. He's somehow... In, but when you get that breakfast in John 21, and they come and, 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 they come and have... He, Jesus cooked breakfast, they're there. Jesus pulls him aside and gives him, do you love me? And when he asks him three times, he, Peter gets the picture. He's giving him a chance to correct the denial here. Praise God. Okay, so not I, he says, in effect. Do you think Peter meant it? That he had a moment's weakness and a lifetime's regret. You know, think the lesson here, there's a lesson we want to look right in the eye. Of all the disciples, who was the most courageous? Peter, boy, he was, uh, uh, he's the guy with the sword in Gethsemane and so forth. He was courageous at the transfiguration. He's the one that walked on the water. And we're all together. You'll say, hey guys, wasn't it neat when you walked on? Oh, that's right, you didn't, did you? Well, let me tell you about it. <laughs> he drew his sword in the garden. Now, you can criticize that, but he was not shy of courage. And yet, the lesson here is he failed in a strong suit. We always assume we're going to fail in our weakest suit. No, 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 not when flesh is involved, not when pride is involved. Our danger zone is in our strongest suit. If you're known for your courage, you may fail in a lack of courage. That's the, in other words, the lesson is not to have any confidence in the flesh. Boy. Okay, well, uh, we, we're, we, we've done it, I think. For the next time, I want you to prepare by reading, and I suggest you read the whole Upper Room Discourse. We'll take chapter 14 specifically, but we'll see how far we get in it. John 14 through 17. Read the Upper Discourse, and I have a surprise for you to add to your reading thing. I'd like you to also read Isaiah 26, starting at verse 19 uh, down to 21. Read Isaiah 26, 19 and 21, and come to your own conclusions. You might also read 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. And you might also read 1 Corinthians 15, 50 to 55. And your question then will be, what do those three passages have to do with John 14? And you may discover a surprise. In fact, several surprises. So I'll leave that with you. And with that, let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the evening, we thank you for your word, we thank you for, for your presence. And we do solicit your guidance, your discerning, uh, uh, we seek discernment, Father, from you. What it is that you would have us draw from these passages, from these lessons, that we each of us might grow in grace and the knowledge of our precious King, and that we might be more pleasing in your sight as we commit ourselves into your hands in his most holy name. Amen.